quorum, so I'm going to get us going. I don't know where the rest of them are, so we're going to get started. Um, I call us to order at, at 6.33. And I don't see that we have a minute taker, so... That's all right, I'll just jot stuff down and it will be... Great. Um, I just want to let you know about um, item D on our agenda, 3D. Um, it says it's a mo um, provide feedback on the monitoring report, and it's really um, it's a uh, language change. It's not feedback on the monitoring report, to, so to speak. It's specifically about changing the schedule that's included in that in, in um, 3.4. So when we get to it, we won't be talking about everything. We're just focusing on that schedule. Level. Included. All right. Um, is there any public comment? Unless you share a comment for the public benefit that it is a clash day at Mount Abraham. Oh. I have not <laughs> lost <laughs> my car. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was admiring your your I nailed it. All right. Um, I like the sparkly too. <laughs> I need a motion to approve the consent agenda, which tonight only contains one thing, the minutes. I'll make the motion. All right, so Chris, is there a second? second. I'll second. All right. All right. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? I abstain. I wasn't here. Okay, let's move down to uh, board management and governance. Our first action item is to um, accept the resignations if we have any. Do we have any? There are none at this time. Right. There are none at this time. All right. Our next action item is to approve the superintendent bond recommendation. And I just we need a motion to start discussing things. So um, move to discuss. All right, Otto. Is there a second? Second. All right. Yeah. All those in favor of uh, opening the discussion, please say aye. 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 Okay. Patrick, I don't know if you want to say anything. Your recommendation was included in the packet. Yeah, I think uh, I included just about all the thoughts I had on about why uh, in my recommendation. So I would just try to answer any questions that folks have based on what was in my recommendation. If we were to try to adjust that recommendation, what would the domino be in terms of timeline? So if we were to adjust that recommendation, we would need to, um, I mean, so, I would need, if you wanted to know precisely what the tax impact was, some information like that, depending on what we adjusted that to, I would need some time to do the new calculations. Um, in terms of moving things forward, it could be as simple as, so I have all the supporting documentation, assuming the recommendation is approved tonight. Um, we would just, it could be as simple as having to change the number that is on the warning and the <clears throat> resolution of necessity and the declaration of intent and the ballot and right, those parts of pieces. So. And then we would have to come back and re vote on that new document. The only question is if, if, if you wanted to know what the tax impact would be based on the modified amount, I would need time to calculate that. Might be able to do it here while we're talking. Um, if not, we'd have to come back so you could know what that impact was if that was a require a prerequisite before voting. Right. Otherwise, I think if it's adjusted and I don't need some time to go and make any adjustments to provide information to know what the impact would be on the adjustment, we could make a note on the warnings and approve as amended and then we could just clean it up in the, uh, in the actual typing of the warning. Although some of them need signatures tonight from folks. Right. So that's where that gets a little more complicated. Does it does it change the timeline? I mean, there's that timing piece that we were. So the window for 
uh, uh, for approving warnings. Um, so it's the not less than 30, not more than 40. That window starts later this week. Uh, it's actually in a couple of weeks. So we would have to, realistically, we probably would have to schedule another meeting of the Mounty Board if we wanted to change that to get everything squared away and have all the new documentation drafted, um, all the you know supporting evidence that might be needed so that we can actually sign the documents with the right information because I think because they require, two documents require signatures of every board member present here, right. that would be hard to make a note on and then get the signatures to be right on that. Right. So, right. Carol, I think, uh, I think all of us received an email from Kevin, yes. who unfortunately is not able to be here tonight. Uh, I think that it might be nice to hear that email. All right, I have that right here. Um, so it's specifically regarding this item, uh, and this is his email. Uh, regarding item 3D, I'm not in favor of the recommendation. Some rationale is as follows. Education funding is stress. The state is beginning to recognize that there are structural issues with the current state income sources, which will put further stress on the education funding. Committing to a bond of this magnitude is not prudent with such income uncertainty and continued pressure for no increased budgets. It will likely require further budget cuts of non-fixed items, the teachers and staff. Student populations are on the decrease and expected to trend in that direction for the foreseeable future, which has brought about Act 46 and the resulting cons consolidations. Schools in our unified district are underutilized. Space, uh, space use across all the buildings in the district needs to be assessed and corrections made to mi maximize use before imp implementing an expensive capital improvement project for one facility. With the importance of understanding and getting space utilization and teacher-pupil ra ratios aligned, bonding commitments should be short-term, not more than five years. There appear to be capital needs in the building fitting, fitting in that horizon but not extensive progr programming changes. Widely accepted measurement metrics placed on Mount A behind all metrics placed Mount A behind all area high schools, Middlebury, Virgins, and CPU. The infusion of 29.5 million into the building is unlikely to move the needle much and likely not at all to, to improve these standings. The renovation would the renovation will will not prompt an influx of people in the area. State populations are declining <coughs> without a reversing trend in sight. There are, there just are not a lot of good paying jobs in Vermont as we operate today and to change this trend. Kevin. Sorry, it's Kevin who? Hanson. Here's his name. He has a name tag. He has a name tag. Mm -hmm. So, so the purpose for reading that letter as compared to reading everything else, including Patrick's document? He's not here, and he sent it as his comment. If somebody and else... We all had, got it. Yep. Same as we got everything else. So he, w I'm not sure that everybody opened and read their emails, so just, yeah, just to come. Might not have opened and read any of it. So, so we, why don't we read Patrick's Patrick. recommendation word for word? We certainly can. I, I have a program. I'd be happy to read it. Sure. So part of my reason for asking first question <clears throat> was: uh, Is there a possibility of separating the question in the bond vote in the language of the vote into two questions, or maybe three? I'd have to ask legal on that. I couldn't say for sure. There, there's there's some pretty strict rules and regulations around what ends up on a ballot or doesn't end up on a ballot and how that's structured. So what if, whatever the wish is of the board, if it's something other than what is presented tonight, I would, I'd have to get some legal advice on that. Can I ask a footnote to Steve's question? <coughs> um, I talked to a couple of people after the, the last vote, and, and several people just remarked, and I didn't prompt them, it just sort of kind of came out that, you know, they read the you know, what's in Article 5 here, which is the same language that's on the ballot. They, they read the ballot, the language of the ballot, which is about this tall, and has all of this very dire stuff 
about who's not going to be you know, paying for this. It's, it's kind of scary. So my question is a, a simple one: is, is 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 that language sort of mandated by who? Just by the lawyers or by the state or, or by whom? The state. The state. The state. Despite okay. my best efforts. Because it's it, it's it's really off-putting. It is. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't even, as I understand it, I don't, it, it, it says that the um, the bond would be at an estimated total project cost of twenty nine five. It doesn't say anything like not to exceed twenty nine five, which puts a different, you know, it, it, using using the not to exceed language puts a little different spin on it than. And then having to represent that the estimated cost is 29.5. Right. Is there any flexibility in that regard? Well, the, I mean, the interesting thing is, so if, and, and this is sort of an educational component, I think. Should we bond for 29.5 million? That is precisely the amount that we are borrowing. Right. Um, and that it's almost regardless of what, and what the total project cost ends up being. Right. If it goes a little bit over and we have money in the budget to help account for the overage, so be it. If it ends up being the, the estimates come in less, then we have some items further down on the, on the priority list that get done that we maybe didn't anticipate. But regardless, 29.5, if that's what the vote is for and that's approved, is what we borrow. So yeah, the, we went around and around a few times with, with the lawyers about, does it really have to say this? Does it really have to say that? This is really too bad. And, and they're even to the point of what is underlined and emphasized has to be underlined and emphasized. Well, it seems, if that's the case, then it seems to me that as in the lead up to the next vote, if there's one in March, there has to be some preparation for you know the fact that they had that they have this language so that when people step into the voting booth they understand what they're what they're reading. I, I would think. Yeah, that, that's always the challenge leading up to a vote is How do you do that? trying to ensure that everyone's educated conceptually, let alone sort of logistically about here's what you're going to see on the ballot and here's <coughs> what it means and here's what you're actually voting on. Yeah. Trying to reach the broader population with that information is a challenge. I just want to check before we go on about autos. Do you want Patrick to read his recommendation? I'd like for Patrick to read it. I would if we're going to have other people's okay. comments read out loud because other people couldn't have order. access to get them, but I'd like to hear Patrick's recommendation read out loud too, please. Okay. Who brought popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> Dear honey, we have board members. It's my recommendation that you approve putting forth a bond vote for the amount of $29.5 million to the voters of Bristol, Lincoln, Moncton, New Haven, and Starksboro on Town Meeting Day 2018 for the purpose of renovating the Mount Abraham School Facility. I recommend a 30-year no. Section 1, justification for the recommendation. Part A, why $29.5 million and not less? After three rounds of identifying stakeholder priorities over the course of four years, priorities have remained the same. That's number one in Section A. Number two. $29.5 million leaves us with a reasonable chance of meeting all the priorities that have remained consistent for four years. Number three, less than $25 million would likely mean we could not meet the priorities that have remained consistent for four years. Part B of section one, why 30-year note versus a 20-year note? Every indication suggests previous bond votes have failed because voters did not feel they could afford to pay for the bond. The primary factor in affordability is the impact on the tax rate. The tax impact of a 30-year note is less than the tax impact of a 20-year note. Part two, or, uh, number two in section B here, tax impact. Tax increase on a 30-year note for $29.5 million is estimated to be $69.10 for $100,000 of assessed value. Tax increase on a 20-year note for $29.5 million is estimated to be $97 per $100,000 of assessed value. This is higher than the estimated tax increase for the, uh, for the November 2017 bond vote, which failed, presumably due to lack of affordability. And then number three, interest paid. The total interest paid on a 30-year note for $29.5 million at an estimated rate of 3.75% is $17,487,832.51. Total interest paid on a 20-year note for $29.5 million at an estimated rate of 3.5% is $11,158,218.38. 
Total interest, interest paid on a 30-year note is $6,329,614.13 greater than the total interest paid on a 20-year note. Part C, there are uh, different circumstances. So November 20, part, uh, number one, November 2014 bond was for $32.6 million, zero dollars $0 budgeted for construction services, and a projected increase in taxes of $153.39 per 100,000 of assessed value. The, the new town meeting day 2018 bond vote for 29.5 million has a million dollars budgeted for construction services already, and that million dollars is approximately 49.6% of the total amount of the bond payment, principal and interest <coughs> for the first year. Each year as the amount we pay in interest goes down, the percent of the payment this money covers will increase. Projected increases in tax rate for this year would be .0691 or $69.10 per 100,000 of assessed value. This is a reduction of $18.50 per 100,000 from the estimated November bond impact of $87.60 per 100,000. Uh, it's a reduction of $84.29 per 100,000 from the estimated 2014 bond impact. Part D, cost of not moving forward. And this is assuming we agree substantial work needs to happen. Interest rate increases. An interest rate increase of half of a percent on $29.5 million over 30 years increases the total interest paid over the life of the loan by more than $2 million. And interest rates are projected to be on the rise. Number two, construction cost increases. The architects and estimators we've been working with tell us construction costs typically increase at a rate of 4 to 5% each year. Assuming a 5% increase each year, the 2014 bond of $32.6 million would be estimated at $37.7 million now. That's an increase of $5.1 million in three years, or $1.7 million each year, or $142,000 per month, or $4,700 per day. Number three, loss of students. An important factor in families choosing where to live is the school system. A high school facility that is outdated can be a uh, deterrent to families choosing to settle in our area. Fewer families moving in negatively impacts the grand list, Smaller grand list means each property needs to generate more tax revenue. This means property owners pay taxes at a higher rate. Number four, pride. <coughs> our students in our community deserve a facility they can be proud of. A student presenter at the 2017 Mount Abraham commencement ceremony said they, the class of 2017, made it, despite the fact that the building is falling apart around them. Number five, risk of emergency repairs. Last fall, the gym floor was ruined by a water leak. This cost considerable money and created a significant disruption to the academic and extracurricular programming at Mount Abe. It also impacted community events scheduled in the Mount Abe gym and the Bristol Elementary gym. Not addressing infrastructure needs leaves us vulnerable to future emergency situations like this. Connection to policy. Number one, ENDS, Part A. The ENDS policy requires the superintendent to ensure students are prepared with the academic life and career and learning and innovation skills necessary to meet the challenges of lifelong learners and to be responsible citizens in a global environment. Today, students are held to a higher standard of learning than ever before. The future of education is in proficiency-based, personalized learning where students are required to demonstrate in authentic ways what they know and can do, um, that they know and can do what is expected to meet the goals outlined in the ENDS policy. Making this future a reality is made more difficult in a building reflective of the educational philosophy of the distant past. Part B, the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum refers to unspoken or unintended messages sent to students while they're at school. What message is sent to students about the importance of the work they do or they are doing when the facility in which they do this work is outdated and in need of significant repair? To the contrary, what message is sent to the students when they work in a modern, bright, light-filled facility they can be proud of? Part 2, Executive Limitations. A. Policy 2.6, Asset Protection, states that the <coughs> superintendent shall not allow district assets to be unprotected or inadequately maintained. It also states the superintendent shall not endanger the organization's public image, its credibility, or its ability to accomplish ends. Not renovating Mount Abraham could be seen as a superintendent being in violation of this policy. A remodeling of this scale comes only once every half century or so, and Mount Abraham is certainly due. If we agree that Mount Abraham is in need of some significant repair, or significant work, which I believe we do, I propose we seize the opportunity to, as our vision suggests, shape our future together. This is our chance to imagine education 50 years out and do what is necessary now, even though it is at a cost. It will be decades before we will get another chance, and the cost, both economic and educational, 
will continue to grow at a rate greater than our ability to afford them. And I'll just add to this that the $29.5 million is the recommendation I received from the study committee. Could you explain to us the difference between the bond vote that was voted down and this bond vote as far as what things are not included in this that were included in that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in talking with the architects, as we, as we kind of went back, and this is through the steering committee, uh, not the steering committee, but the study committee, um, the approach we had taken before was Basically, here are all the things we want to do. Please put them into sort of a, a conceptual drawing and estimate them for the, the smallest amount of money you can. That produced a total project cost of $36.6 million. Through lots of conversation with the, um, with the study committee and looking back to the previous bond vote as well, uh, four years ago, everyone was in agreement the reason this isn't passing isn't because people don't think the building needs work necessarily, it's because it's too costly. So then the conversation shifted more towards, so what is an amount of money that we think is enough, given what we know, to do much or most of the work that we believe is important based on these priorities that have been set and really maintained over the course of four years? Uh, but will actually pass a vote of the electorate. And it's that conversation that landed at $29.5 million. So then it shifts the way we work with the architects and the cost estimators. Now it's, here's how much money you'll have to work with. What could we get done for that? And the, it, it would take many, many weeks for the architects to actually complete a new set of drawings, and it would also cost many, many dollars. Uh, so time equals money when we're working with folks like that, right? So um, to produce new drawings that show the scope of work that would get done for 29.5. Conceptually, in conversations with the architects, it was, there was a belief that for 29.5, we could get the same priorities met, but in a different way than what we had talked about before. A good example being, if we think about the curtain wall, which is basically sort of the, the facelift to the front of the building, which, which addresses both sort of the, the curb appeal, which was a desire, but more importantly addresses a lot of the natural light need for that front and some of the security need for the front of the building. That was estimated at, I think, 1.3 or so million dollars in the, in the last round. Um, there are ways that we can scale the scope of that portion of the project back and do a little bit less of that for less money. So still hitting the priority, not hitting it to the same level we would have hit the priority with more money, um, but a scaled back version of hitting the same priority. So that idea times a few different bigger projects, you know, looking at a different kind of construction for the gym that costs less money, but still having a gym. Um, that is sort of the, the conceptual conversation that happened um, with the architects, and through that, the architects advised, uh, so the two numbers that, that the architects we discussed this with were um, the 29 and 25 million. Architects said, yeah, 29, 29, five, we can probably hit most of those uh, priorities at a lesser degree. 25 million, you're not getting all those priorities. And that, that I think, and Chris could speak more, more so to this, I think that was a driving factor in the recommendation that came from the study committee and that, for me, is why I think it makes sense as well. So there isn't a specific, this won't get done at this rate right now. What about changing the library? So it would still hit that priority. That, that was something that stuck through three rounds over four years as a priority um, of the library coming up to the front. Maybe there won't be as many windows in the front of the library as the original design had, um, but the library would still get moved. It's important to remember Sorry. Sorry. Um, that the, the driving force in the last <coughs> November bond and this, this coming one in moving the library is not just to move the library, 
it's to give Tech Ed, Wood Shop, and Metal Shop the space that they need to run those programs effectively. It, so moving the library is a byproduct of taking care of the other programs. And if we're going to move the library anyway, it should be towards the front where it's more situated with the gym and the other public use spaces so that the community can use that more um, and, and see it and, and the, the kids. Can, the kids need a, a updated. It's not so much books like technology. It's more of a media center than, than a library. You know? And also push it to the perimeter so it's not right. landlocked where it can't right. have access to natural light. Pushing it to right. the perimeter gives it access to natural light. So we, we want to uh, keep programming and um, do things. The, the shops don't belong at the front of the school. They, they should be in the back. Steve? So also, um, wasn't there some thought in dropping the budget that during this <clears throat> last exercise when we kind of re-looked at priorities that um, there was a list of 10 or so? That nine. 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 The top nine. And that nine. the budget would be kind of tailored once details came out um, to address what we could afford on that <clears throat> list until the budget couldn't afford the next priority. Does that make sense? So if the 29.5 could, I think number one was the gym, and then I'm forgetting the list, but <clears throat> you know, the 29 point, we would fix the building, we do the gym work, and we basically, in the process of the design um, <clears throat> development that happens after the bond, we would basically set a bar or whatever, you know, in that order of priorities. Is that priority list that came out in the meeting? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a bit yes. Yeah. Okay. May I ask Chris a question? Sure. Do you have the list of those nine priorities? Yes, they're in the meeting minutes from the renovation committee meeting. Okay. Are they available to you tonight? Right, I know. I could probably pull them up. <clears throat> Steve. So, my next question in terms of splitting the hope, um, I was curious legally if it's possible to set something up. Or my, my biggest fear is that, um, you know, maybe Kevin is right, maybe the, the electorate decides to basically follow the path we've seen so far in the last couple of votes, and this reduction isn't enough to sway enough people to have something happen. Well, to try to um, <coughs> maintain our basic fiduciary duty to make the building healthy and safe and accessible and the, the base package um, to make something happen because that's at risk if the bond goes down again. That, that piece of work is at risk. And I think that piece of work, from what I've been hearing, has the most public support as a baseline activity. So is it possible to set up the vote so that you basically can ask whether an amount would be approved to take care of that as a first question, yes or no? And then, uh, either as the second or third question, say would you also be willing to add to that an amount to take care of the gym, which is the next big priority. The third question would be then to authorize, you know, the bonding for the amount to take care of whatever priorities we add up to the 29.5. Um, I, I think I could respond to that. So I'd have to confirm to be sure, but in conversation with sort of legal counsel throughout this process, um, so that idea, so a, a similar idea, I think, at least has come up where can't we put on the ballot choose this amount that you support, which is similar, I think, to what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm and trying to narrow it down so we won't have quite as much flexibility. But that. even if there were two choices, yeah. we can't do that. Right. Brad? Yeah, just to follow up on this. <clears throat> I mean, I, you know, as far as your recommendation, Patrick, I'm 100%, maybe 500% behind it. I think it's all right on. Um, I think it's important, though, uh, and I you know, apologize a little bit, I'm new to the board, but I think it would be useful to have a discussion about the risk 
at risk management and optics with respect to you know, what happens, as Steve was mentioning, if the bond does not pass. And because then all of a sudden you have three in a row and you can't go for another year. Um, so the question I had was, is you know, one of the things that is attractive about the, the recommendation of, that you're making uh, and that we discussed at Nauseam in the Renovation Committee is the is making the whole deal you know affordable and, and right now it's it's never going to be more affordable than you know in the future it's not going to be more it, than it is now and, and I think that's a very compelling um, argument but I'm not sure whether it has resonated so well and you know you know among the, the, the voters mm -hmm. um, so my question is and, and one of, and, and the way the way you structure this is to use the budgeted one million dollars you know to pay for part of the bond. Is it possible to separate, you know, to, you know, to, to separate the two, keep the one million dollars in the budget, and then, you know, we, which represents what, seventeen million dollars or something, or, or sixteen million dollars? In terms of what that would cover for what that would cover of the thirty of the, of the thirty million, yeah, something probably like that. the ballpark. Yeah. You know, keep the one million dollars in the budget, um, but then go to the voters for the, um, you know, for a much lesser amount to cover all of the infrastructure. And sort of you know, basic stuff that, that really has to get done, um, and then and then you know so and, 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 and finance that that say pick a number eighteen million or whatever finance eighteen million through a, through a bond that is passed in March, but keep the one million dollars in in the budget to do some of this other stuff, the auditorium, the library, the, the second gym is is something like that been considered? Yeah. So I've considered it. I don't know how widely it's been considered. The, the, the challenge I see with that scenario is it, it's, it's likely that the tax impact ends up being about the same because we're not using the million dollars to help pay for the bond. I know. And so, we have, so the tax impact, so the affordability question ends up being the same uh, right. either way. But from a fiduciary responsibility kind of perspective, we're instead of paying three and a half, three and three quarter percent interest, we're paying 5% construction cost escalation because now we're, so to do the auditorium, we'd have to save for two years of that million dollars, do nothing else with it, save it, then we'd have two million dollars and we could start the construction project in the auditorium. And in those two years, it's now increased 5%, 10% in cost. And so what you get over the same 30 years, so you either pay a lot more money than bonding for the whole thing over 30 years to get the same work done, or more likely is you pay the same amount of money over 30 years and get a lot less done. No, I, I totally agree and I totally get it. Because I, I assume you can't leverage the, the one million dollars for other borrow, other borrowing. You know, I'm sure more, you know, more, you know, more conventional bar, borrowing as opposed to you know, um, you know, a bond. If you have the million dollars, you can say, okay, you use that money to leverage a loan to do Right, like a down payment on a loan right, or something. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we couldn't do that necessarily. We'd have to investigate it. I don't know why we would, because I'm not sure we'd get a better interest rate than going through the municipal bond bank. Yeah. Well, well, again, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it, it's not a smart way to go financially and, you know, in terms of saving money over the longer term. But again, I'm just not sure that the sort of the, the fiscal responsibility piece that you know we've tried to convey over the last four or five months has resonated with, right. with, with, you know, with voters. And I agree with that the, 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 the million dollar question, pun intended, is <laughs> what is the amount of money that voters will pass? Right. And nobody knows the answer to that. I, we, could all, we could all say $2 million for sure, that will pass, no question. $10 million, probably still, but less <laughs> likely than $2 million. $17 million, uh, maybe, but not as much as $10 million. So finding what's the amount of money that will pass that actually gets some work done, because I think another risk is, okay, so we just approved $17 million, and we put $17 million into the building, and you walk in, and it looks just like it did before you put $17 million into it. And people say, well, what did we get for that? So like, I don't know that that's something that people really want to experience either. Allison? And part of the problem of, and I'm sure we talked about this in the renovation committee meetings, but piecemealing. So you, you wait, you build up $2 million over two years, do nothing to the auditorium. Well, there are spaces around the auditorium that will have work done to them. The walls will have to be closed back up, and then you have to open up 
it again because it's attached to the auditorium project, not the other classroom or whatever else projects. And then there's all this stuff in the ceiling. Things are, you know, plumbing's attached. So you do something at one end of the building and you open up the asbestos thing issue and all of it has to be addressed from one end of the building to the other end. So most likely we'll end up using the auditorium as an example, doing all of that ceiling work, but you're not gonna be working on the auditorium, so you close it back up. And then when you're ready to work on the auditorium, you open it back up. So redoing work that's already been done is not a uh, fiscally responsible way of doing something. Um, and I was just answering that. And then I think, I wonder if part of the problem is people see 36 million, 35 million, 32.6 million, 29.5 million, 25 million as I'm paying $25 million. Holy cow, I can't afford $25 million. Well, I would guess that probably almost everybody in our community cannot afford $25 million, but spread out across the taxpayers across 30 years at $69.10, estimated at this moment in time with the information that we have, is $69.10 a year for 30 years, for 29 and a half million. I don't know of any other kind of project where we can get that much bang for your buck at $69.10 for 30 years per year. And we know that that amount will never ever increase. Um, <coughs> I'm just concerned that we're losing sight of what needs to, what we need to do. And as a board, it's our responsibility to take everything into consideration, but also look to the future. Um, and if we get mired into some comments from the public, I would, I would say that we do not have all of the comments from all of the public. We only have a small segment of the public talking to us, and it's half and half. So half is yes and half is no, and that's borne out in the surveys. So we as a board need to be willing to um, take the challenge and tell our community that we know things need to be done to the building and we want to do them. We need to do them all at the same time across with a, a big budget that might seem scary, but in the end accomplishes the priority list that actually probably goes back to 2000 when the first renovation was happening. So um, I'm afraid we're gonna end up having the same conversation over and over and over again and miss out on the opportunity of the interest rates and being able to get this done at the cost that we're being quoted at. And we'll just end up paying more for a lot less. So I'm reminded of, and I, not all of you were here at the time, but when we had three budgets that got voted down and we kept hearing one message at our meeting over and over and over again. And finally, at one of the last meetings, a, a community member came in and said, I elected you to come and, and, and look out for this organization for us. And, and I, I, mean, I want you to lead us down the road. And I, as you were saying that, I think that that's a piece we have to remember. We are elected to oversee and to look out and be trustees for this organization. So we have to look down the road and we have to lead our communities to this, to this one way or another. Because that person never came to those first two or three or four other meetings when all those voices, but she came and she finally said, don't forget, we're looking to you to lead us, so. Chris. I have the priorities that Carol meant for the record. We'll just put them out there. So um, these are in the order that 
the um, community groups decided at the December or November 27th meeting. Um, but, so they may be in a different order than prior committees have, have deemed them, but they're, they're all the same. Um, number one was a second gym. Two was lighting, which would be natural and better inside lighting. Uh, three was air quality. Four was to update the science classrooms. Five is renovating and moving the library. Six is updating the lobby and office area. That would be for security purposes. Uh, seven is the tech ed space. Eight is the auditorium. And nine is removing the tandem classrooms. So I just want to say that I'm have been from the start really all of this. I'm just looking for some way to give more folks a choice during the vote process that might end us up with something happening in March rather than maybe the whole bath. And I guess it might without the baby unit. Part of my thinking on that too is so obviously there, there's a fear of it not passing in March, um, as there was a fear of it not passing in November, as there was a fear of not passing the time before that. I mean that's always the fear. Um, but I think about to drop it so low to an amount that there's no fear of it passing, and sacrificing what we know will be high priority items. Um, doesn't feel like that's necessarily the way to go. And I, I would almost rather sort of hedge my bet the other way that it passes. And if it doesn't, well, in a year we get two more chances to pass a bond. And we'll keep going down to find what the magic number is. Um, rather than just go all the way down there now knowing what impact that's going to have on the project that gets done. Yeah, and I wasn't suggesting that we, we attempt to uh, do a single vote on really low ball number. It's really just setting a bar that gave people then the choice to add to that bar if so they're so inclined rather than yeah. making either one side or the other of that fence. Yeah. And I don't think again I could if it's not I'm pretty certain it's not an option. If it's not an option then it's it's gotta be a number. And there was great information in John's article from Monday, I think it was it was about about the budget, not the renovation, but it had projected enrollment numbers and all that, and I think it's by 2022, we're gonna be up above where we are now, um, projected to be, yeah. so um, it, it's not, that's not that far out. <laughs> 2022 is gonna be here before we know it. Yeah, I think the takeaway from that is, we're gonna see a little more of a dip in enrollment, and then it's gonna come back up to kind of where we are now, right. and then, hard to predict. I mean, every year out you go with enrollment projections are a little less um, secure. But if we don't do anything, we're going to... Well, and I also up. think, you know, it's, it, we're in pretty interesting times in the state of Vermont, what's happening with education and the whole statewide declining enrollment. To assume that this building will always be a 712 building is just that, an assumption. It could be lots of different things. Um, and we don't really know what that's going to be 10 years from now, let alone 30 years from now when this is done being paid for, let alone 50 years from now when we're going to have to renovate again. <laughs> um, so I just challenge us to, to not only think of it as what it is now, but think about whether or not we wish to continue to have students here. And that's really what it boils down to for me. If we're going to continue to have kids here, whether it's more kids or less kids, we have a building that needs to be taken care of. So unless we're committed to, at some point in time, transitioning away from operating this building as a high school, which is not something I'm interested in doing right now, then I think we need to commit to operating this building. Chris? Is there anything from the lawyers that says we can't put out samples of the ballots ahead of time so people aren't shocked when they walk in by that language and we can explain 
I haven't specifically been told by the lawyers we can't do that, but I also haven't asked the question. <laughs> we learned that before. So you put a sample ballot out before the election so you can say, see it when you go to vote. Oh, There's okay. a sample. It, it says sample. Don't they also uh, yeah, can you highlight all the parts that the, are stipulated to be in it? Like, <laughs> this entire block must be there. This sentence is describing the bond. All the rest of this stuff is there because it has to be there, or something like that. Right. I, I so suspect there's some flexibility in, in the way we educate people about what they're voting on. I think we have some latitude in, in how we make sure people know what they're voting on. Just formatting this as obvious. Right. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, again, an explanation. This would be for explanation. I'm sorry, I went out of order. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, it would be for explanation purposes. Again, sample ballot, circling the parts, you know, with an annotation. These yeah. paragraphs, really? these statements must be in there. This sentence right here is what's describing the content that you're voting on. I think it, it's really that level of, I mean, it's one or two sentences in that document that describes what we're voting on. The rest of it is just the disclaimers that are, are there because it's the state's boilerplate. So if you could explain that, then maybe people might not have so much angst about it. Chair, in speaking about when the ballots would be ready, anybody that wants to vote by mail, you know, those ballots have to be ready uh, early. <coughs> so in, I'm not sure how soon people can do absentee ballots, but that shows that the ballots are going to be out there readily available for people to see. All right, anyone else want to make a comment? State their case. Sandy. Sure. So um, this, Saturday, this past Saturday, there was a Bristol community gathering regarding just questions about education. It was, um, gosh, there must have been at least 60 plus people. 75. 75 people who were present. Five towns. Uh, five, five towns. Five towns. It was just from, it, was it just was held the at school. the Bristol Community right. School. But it was from the it was from the five towns, and um, I thought it was a pretty amazing turnout. It was a really wonderful gathering of people with different views, but also clearly caring about the whole five town community. And what really came across to me when we broke out into these three groups in the building, specifically, and how it connected the community was one group. Uh, the group that I sat in was about how can Mount Native support the community and vice versa. And the building ultimately did come up and there were some really great ideas about how, you know, sometimes people only think of this school as being the place that we educate our 7th graders through 12th graders, but really if we're thinking forward about what a resource this building is and this whole institution is, that um, this renovation is very much tied to how we make this a center of this five town community. And by improving it, um, like one of the priorities is making the library move forward so it's an actual community space. So it's not just for your seventh to twelfth graders and those activities, but it's open to people who don't have children in the community but they can link with the community or um, adult learning classes. You know, there. The way that the spaces, I mean, I imagine there have been that maybe already happening right now anyway, and I understood in the past it used to be more from what I got from other people than it is today. But again, because of the, uh, probably the issues with the building and improvement, it's just not as available and accessible. And um, there was a lot of really wonderful talk about how it, it could be really a space that everyone takes part in. People who have kids in the community, people who don't or have had in the past, um, and that really sort of makes it feel like, okay, that's a place for all of us. As a future that I agree with that I'm not prepared by any means that this community isn't going to have a school that educates its 7th graders and 12th grade graders. But it also can be so much more, and you can do all of those things. And so, um, you know, that's something that in the design you know, phase, once the bond is passed, if it's passed, that people can talk about more. But it really was impressed upon me that the community members that were very com committed to this whole five town community with very div diverse perspectives, views on costs and all those issues, but they were prepared to come on a really cold Saturday. It was freezing, <laughs> right? And they all came from all over the town and participated and I thought it was a wonderful gathering. So, and what I got from that group of people was that they're very supportive of our school being a strong, 
community, the building being a good place. And so, um, you know, I trust that the administration and the superintendent has done the research, has gone through the numbers, is really looking to the future of our uh, education system, but also for our community as a whole. And that, um, and, and with all that in mind and all the due diligence that uh, the administration has gone through, that I'm fully in support of the recommendation. And I think the, the challenge that we are going to have as board members is to really remind people that it's not just about your kids who are going to the school. This is the center of the five town community. You know, and if it, if it wasn't here, what do you have, why are you here? Why do you have these five towns? What are, you know, what is exactly that's going on if you think about it um, from that perspective? And we do, we have a responsibility. This building is here. We're not going to simply allow it just to rot away, hopefully. I mean, otherwise we simply would not be doing our fiduciary duty. So all those things I think are really essential. Um, and I think we definitely, were, we have, if, we, if the board recommends it, which I'm fully expecting and hoping that we'll do, we definitely have our job in making sure we continue to uh, communicate to the community why it's so important. Brad? Yeah, the, the one um, action item that came out of that meeting last Saturday was creating some sort of an organization, mm -hmm. community-based organization, a 501c3 or something, that would, you know, whose purpose would be to engage you know, with the school system. I was struck that the, uh, even though the bond vote was sort of like the elephant in the room, there really was no conversation about that. So people weren't getting up and saying, I'm against the vote or I'm you know, for the vote or whatever. And, and that, I, I found that very helpful. Um, the other thing that I was struck by, though, is that despite the, the, sort of the, the intent was to create sort of a forum that, in, that, that includes many more individuals, unfortunately, the people who were there were were pretty much the people you'd expect to be there. And I'm not sure that that undertaking is, you know, you know will be hugely successful in attracting um, the numbers of people who really want to get into some kind of dialogue like that. It's just, it's just such a tough nut to crack. But it was, overall, it was a very, very helpful, I think, uh, meeting. Can I ask a question to them about that meeting, one specific yeah. question? Um, any insight from the people who participated in that meeting as to why they didn't participate in the renovation committee meetings as public participation or why they don't choose to participate more actively in the strategy committee meeting or any of these other public meetings where we're open to input from the public? I, 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 any insight as to why that? <clears throat> I asked David Grin that direct question and he had no answer for me. Because, you know, yeah. okay, so. So, I've asked the question myself, and I have yeah. not heard a cogent response to yeah. my question. So I'm, I'm just, just curious to me. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I can only go from my own experience about how I found out about the meeting. It strictly was word of mouth. It was just word of mouth. I had one person at Sandy. Do you know about the meeting that they're holding on Saturday? And I, you know, I have front porch forum, but I have the Lincoln front porch forum, and I check it. And you know, I'm busy with work and stuff, and I do school board, and I check the calendar. But I had no idea that this, me this meeting was happening on Saturday till about like two days beforehand. It was strictly by word of mouth of people f for somewhere it started and for some reason they were able to connect with the, s the community that was able to just keep spreading the word. Have you heard about this meeting that they're having? And so um, based on that and everything that's happening, I thought, you know, that sounds like an important meeting. Um, you know, one of the things I'm, you know, I assume my term ends and I've been doing policy governance work and it really, I'm impressed constantly by our role as the board to figure out how to connect to our community and what it's hard to do when you're here sitting in this room versus you know and you're busy with your life and actually how do you connect with the community and so when I heard there was this meeting I thought well as a board member I think I better go because we keep identifying that we're not fully getting connected to the whole <coughs> community so I thought well I better start here I better go see what it's about and I agree that the, the biggest thing that I that actually um, it resonated with me. I wasn't. Exp I had no idea what the meeting really was going to be about. I was just like, I'll come. And uh, it did resonate to me this idea of um, an organization that's a community sort of organization. And the reason it resonated to me is I really saw it as a incredibly helpful support to a board to be that extra those extra fingers out in the community 
that you, you add, you, if you get a whole other organization that is committed and has said, I will go to this meeting, I will be on this organization, I will commit to it, I will go to the meetings, you know, I'll make it a priority in my very busy schedule, just like we do when we're on the board. We make this a priority, that's why we're here and we get involved. But if you have a whole other organization that says, I am committed to, to being present and talking about these things and talking to other people about it, then you have all those extra people and all their contacts and all their people who can network and spread out and be connected. And so if they're, if they're committed and they can reach out, to me that was great because then they could be a wonderful support and resource um, to the school and to the board um, and have that sort of diverse connection to maybe all the different people in our five towns. And so. Um, I, I thought it was a great idea, and if that was something uh, that could happen in a very positive way to be supportive and give input, um, pros, cons, concerns, all those things to the school and school boards, um, and people were willing to put that energy and that time, why, why not? So that, I thought that was a great thing. Yeah, just one more question. Well, I don't want to get too far down this, this other community because we really need to mm -hmm. get back to our bond recommendation. So. Okay. Well, it's related. I mean, it's okay. related to something that Alice and I have talked about a lot. Is that one of the things about that meeting that was sort of the downer, downer of it was that you have very few pa parents of school age children there. Really? Most, oh, of, most of the people were, you know, people whose kids were grown or have no kids, and, and so I was a little disheartened by that. And, but that gets right to, I mean, it, the communication efforts that have to be undertaken if we're going to go forward with, the, with, this, with this bond, because we have to get those people involved. Sorry, Steve. Oh, actually, I'm all set. Okay. All right. So, Jim. Just, uh, <clears throat> Visiting with people, I think uh, they all start out, they all have their reasons, uh, you know, we don't want to pay any more taxes, uh, the enrollment's declining, uh, quality education is not going to improve immediately if we dump X million dollars into the building, so on, so on. Actually, and people in Bristol have been the most vocal that I've talked to, but I don't know why that is, but um, after you talk to them for a little while, it gets down to the bottom line is that there isn't a magic number, you know, it, it's because they, they don't really, I don't think they grasp the whole concept here. And they do realize that piecemealing is not good because you're doing the same thing over and over again. So it's pretty much got to be, uh, you know, the bond go forward and vote on it and see. Um, like I say, we've got a couple more opportunities down the road if it doesn't. But if it does, that's great because of the, the, uh, when they realize that the same concerns have been consistent for so many years, they start to, hmm, maybe, hmm, hmm. So I think it's kind of in how it's delivered to the public when they go to vote. And I think it's got a pretty good chance for people, that, people I've talked to that would definitely know I kind of reverse their uh, opinion on it after you visit with them for a little while. So. Well, if nobody has any more discussion, the next step would be to make a motion to approve the recommendation. Move to approve. Right. Second. Who is second? Steve? You want to talk about it anymore? All, right. All those in favor of approving the recommendation, the superintendent's bond recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Do you want it noted? Aye. Would you like it noted in the minutes, yes, please? Any abstentions? All right. All right. Okay. All right. So the next uh, item is to approve the warnings and the accompanying bond documents, the declaration of intent, the bond ballot, and the resolution of necessity. So I'll say this now, before everybody runs out at the end of the meeting, stop and sign. There are a couple documents that will need everybody's signature. Do you need a motion to discuss it? Oh. You know what, you can, you can approve it, and you can make a motion to approve it, we can discuss it, and we can vote after the discussion. 
Sorry. Move to approve. All right. Otto and Chris. All right. Now you can discuss it. You had actually caught that question on the. Um, uh, I actually did. It's it's under the the question I had was on the warning the warning for the annual meeting. Article five lists the the bond information as Article five, and I just have never seen it there without. Like in Moncton when we did this before, it said for discussion only when it was on. So I just didn't know if this something had happened that was different. Did the lawyers say we had? I just wondered because it's not going to be voted at the annual meeting, correct? Right. It'll be voted, and it says somewhere that it's voted by Australian Valley. I'm trying to find that language. But I just want to make sure. So Article 5 requires a vote by Australian ballot to occur at the official polling places the in the towns yeah. yep. on Tuesday, so they, March 6th. Okay. I think legally that's what they're saying is that's notification that we're not acting on Article 5 tonight, that it is in fact for information only. It just doesn't say in Article 5. For discussion. For discussion. Okay. Like that was the only thing that it was like, wait, I've only ever seen it say for discussion only. There's confusion. I'll have to give Pam a primer before. <laughs> well, that. That was when I saw that, and I thought, oh, we only have an hour. So, but that's Pam's job, just keep us contained in that hour. So, <laughs> I just heard about it on the TV. And there will be a conversation prior to the meeting. Yeah. So. And then there's another, what did I see? There's a meeting on the 28th? Yes. Right. So, we legally have to have. One community forum on the before the vote, before the vote. Specifically, I think within ten days prior to the right. vote. Okay. So that's what that meeting is. So that that's the only one that we legally have to identify. There may very well be many other opportunities for conversation, but and that will require this board to meet. Correct. I'll have to find out for sure. Okay. I would hope that we would be in attendance anyway. Okay. Anyone else have any questions around the warnings? There, like I said, there are the, the uh, annual meeting warnings, the bond vote, more the paperwork. So it's some of it uh, as chair I will sign, but then there are other ones that we all have to sign. Want to talk? No talking. <laughs> Any concerns? We're going to do it. <laughs> it's very similar to what we did. Yeah, it is similar. All right. Hasn't been that long. Nope. <laughs> all right. So, all those in favor of approving the warnings and uh, the accompanying bond documents, the declaration of intent, the bond ballot, and the resolution of necessity, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Our next item is a discussion item, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, it's to provide feedback on the language change included in 3.4, monitoring the superintendent's performance. So the changes are specifically around that schedule at the bottom of the policy, which um, talks about the frequency of some information that boards receive. Try to get to that page. Policy and Governance Committee worked to kind of reorganize that so it was flowed more with the schedule of the way things were happening. Just an annual language. Right. <laughs> so it can happen whenever. Yeah. Makes sense. 
had brought that big umbrella again. I think it used to be much more specific. This month, that month. Okay. Yes, it did say like September, February, then you're and then screwed if you don't have. You know, well, <laughs> right, exactly. Some some reports said they were doing February, but the information that was we needed for that report wasn't supplied until September, so you never had it. So if you have no feedback, we'll just keep them. All right. All right. I don't think we need an executive session. No? Is there any public comment at this time? John? Uh, I have a public comment on observations of how I've like, witnessed all these meetings that have been going on. And it's really to answer Otto's question on how to get people out. Um, and I think it, the way I really saw it was the pleasant surprise at the forum that you guys held at Holly Hall and how people were kind of going there expecting to be angry and like kind of really pissed off and not being able to speak. I think the main problem with people coming to these meetings is the actual schedule of things and that they only have beginning and end to talk. And so now they're kind of fuming for an hour and a half waiting for the board meeting to get over and to speak their mind at the very end. And the reason why I think the forum, forum worked really well on Saturday was the fact that nobody was even thinking about time except for the timekeeper and that like while you were discussing, you were just discussing, and everyone was taking their turn to speak their mind, and you went around three or four times, and they all spoke, but it was a very informal way of allowing people to speak, and so uh, Sue gave a review of it at that, and was saying, like, she was extremely surprised on how that forum was well done, and that you allowed everybody to ask their questions, and then you answered them politely, and then the next person asked a question. And I think getting out of the schedule and doing a forum and an informal meeting for these people would be a better place for them to show up rather than you guys doing your important stuff. And Otto, I think that's actually um, part of what spurred on that Saturday meeting. Mm -hmm. And one of the comments that happened, and they, they also commented on how well they thought the budget meeting went at Holly Hall. But it was the ability to get out of, of uh, the stricture of this meeting format and be able to just have a free flow of conversation. So I, I thought just as part of done part of our work with the new unified board that that seemed like a nice idea, a nice format to have occasionally as a community engagement piece. I'm going to express a personal opinion that talking is good, but the work of governing is more than talking. And participating in the structure that has been set up to govern our entire school system includes more than coming to a community forum and speaking your mind. It includes showing up to the ends committee meeting and grinding out the documents that form the foundation upon which we ask the superintendent and his administration to administer our policies and educate our students. And talking about that is interesting. Participating in that is where the work happens. And it's curious to me that the talking happens, but I don't see as much participation in the work. And maybe we need to do a better job of explaining how the system works if people really truly want to participate. Um, because, again, talking is talking, but th there's work that happens to govern, and I don't see the connection. I, that, that's, my, that's my difficulty, is I'm not sure that I, I see the connection. So hearing what people have to say is important, but then there needs to be something more beyond that, I think, to turn that discussion into the foundation upon which we ask the administration to exercise the policies. That's my personal opinion. I'm not expressing that on behalf of the board. <laughs> Same. It's kind of as a board, but as a community member, because it was interesting to be on both sides. So um, it does address some of your questions. So the word of mouth that I received about the Saturday meeting came from sitting during the budget meeting, which was last Wednesday. So I did. I agree that was a really good forum with people talking and people were chatting. And in that large group of people who showed there on Wednesday, which was very well attended, I thought, um, there was word of mouth of, do you know that there's this, you know, other community gathering, just if people are interested to be supportive and 
to gather as a community. I said, sure. And so then that was the word of mouth piece, which may have then led to why Saturday was also well attended because it just sort of spread about. But, um, you know, uh, I'm on the policy governance committee with Don and, you know, other members of the, the five towns. And um, it's really just year in, year out, really trying to understand how policy governance works. Our job here in these meetings, I mean, there's a reason for the structure. We have business that has to get done. And so the, there's a good reason for that structure. Um, the challenge for the board is how we take outside of these board meetings, not necessarily in the board meetings, but outside of that, how do we connect to the community and these other community gatherings in other ways and information. And, and as board members take that, hear it, and as um, board members bring that back um, and be informed by that information. So all these things can happen. Like the community talk, not all those community members are going to be here doing business. We don't expect them to be, but we do want them to participate and have a voice. And so the more that I think the community feels engaged in having a voice and talk about opinions and gatherings, and then we as board members are able to gather that information and, and use it and inform us on the decisions that are made and the recommendations given by the administration. Because really it's a policy where, where we, get, we govern, we move policy. The day in, day out running is the administration. So we need to know what our, um, what's it called, the, the people who are the, the beneficiaries and those who are in the community. How do we do that? So that is the challenge. I agree that connection that we're talking about. And I think people are coming out to express themselves. It's just how can we also, if they're not going to come to like a community forum, again, how do we get you know everybody's views for those who can come and not come? And it's interesting because. Um, I actually been heartened by the fact that there were people without children at that meeting, and that was a vast majority because, you know, with me, I had kids who were in the school, and that's really how I initially became really involved with the school and what prompted me to becoming a board member. And then the people I know often have children too, but it, it actually makes me feel good to know that there are people who their kids aren't even in the school anymore. You know, they're not even going to be coming. They're done with having kids, but they're still committed uh, to the education in this community, so it's kind of an interesting. Uh, yeah, it <coughs> cuts both ways, I guess. Right, right, exactly. It's interesting. All right. Thanks, Sean, for your comment. Yes, I'd like to. I agree with what Sean said. I felt that way since the beginning when policy governance first became the way things were run. Um, I've been attending Moncton board meetings since I moved into Moncton, probably about 30 years ago, maybe longer. Um, I have tried to attend Mount Aid board meetings as much as possible. In the last couple of years, maybe not quite that long, it has been very difficult to attend both Moncton and Mount Aid board meetings. I left the Moncton, Moncton board meeting tonight to come here. Um, a teacher in Moncton asked me to convey to the Moncton board that she would be attending meetings if they were local, but it's almost impossible for her to do that when they're here in Bristol. Um, and she also asked, if possible, for me to say that to make sure that Patrick was able to hear that because I'm not sure the Moncton board um, had a representative from the administration to hear that at the time that I was able to make the comment. And in response to what Otto said, attending meetings does not do me as much good as I would like it to when I can only speak in the beginning and the end. I, during this meeting alone, had several times when I would had a comment or a question and was not allowed to do that. So I can't help with the work when I can't participate. Um, but in the past, I did have that opportunity and I, and I felt that I was able to take that opportunity so. Okay. Um, does somebody have Otto? Do you happen to have the meeting evaluation up that you could run through it? Happy to. Thank you. Date of the meeting. You got that? Name of person completing assessment. That shall be me. What is the level of engagement of all board members? High or low? Seems high to me. <laughs> Was the agenda followed, yes or no? Yes. 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 Was the agenda linked to the board's annual work plan, yes or no? Yes. 
Yes. <coughs> was there sufficient board time spent on community linkage? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'd say. Was there, excuse me, there was sufficient board time spent on ENDS discussion, ENDS yes. discussion. Yes. There was sufficient board time spent on executive limitations. Yes, yes, yes. The consent agenda was used appropriately. Yes. yes. What went well with the meeting? Well, well, we've been around. The yeah, I know. <laughs> we're coming back around. Okay, it was on time. Anything else that went well with the meeting? Yeah. Everyone participating? Yeah, good discussion. So I have two comments that went well, it was on time, and participation. Any other comments on what went well with the meeting? What concerns do you have with the meeting? I'm missing some. Well, just two, I guess. Just Would you like me to document that? No, there's like we're actually missing three. No, two. Three. We're missing three. 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 Oh. Yep. Would you like me to write that? Not all board members are in the room. Okay, whatever it was, not all board members present. Other concerns you have with the meeting? How could this meeting be improved? I think it went well. That would be done. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Move yes. to adjourn. Second. Oh, and all those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you.